Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Glad to see everybody here this morning in the uh, Klein campus and those of you who are joining us uh, from the Woodlands Thank you. Thank you for being here and there. And uh, of course, those of you who are, are uh, joining us online, it's always fun to welcome you and, and thanks for spending some time with us. Um, I don't know if you, uh, if you saw this uh, story over the last week. Maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. There were kind of two intriguing um, religious news stories that made the headlines last week. Uh, uh, and, and both of them uh, had to do with Donald Trump. Don Have you heard that name, Donald Trump, before? Yeah, okay, good, good. Yeah, well, story number one was about a gathering of the top 1,000 evangelical leaders uh, who met with Mr. Trump, uh, who, of course, is the presumptive presidential uh, candidate at the uh, Marriott Marquis Hotel uh, in New York City. Uh, and let me just say, first of all, that I'm not even gonna try to disguise uh, my disappointment that I was not invited to this <laughs> Gathering, My wife assures me that on the list of uh, significant evangelical leaders, I am probably number 1,001. Uh, but still, that oversight was a little bit hurtful. But uh, anyway, you probably heard uh, that this meeting was met by a lot of skepticism, even, even among some uh, of the very evangelical leaders at the meeting, many of whom were suspicious that, you know, that this was just some sort of kind of uh, a political theater presidential candidate who wanted to sort of uh, baptize his campaign in the holy water of, of trusted big name Christian leaders. And then uh, story number two broke. And story number two, just as everybody was digesting the news about the big gathering in New York City, uh, a second story emerged that Donald Trump had become a Christian. Dr. James Dobson, most of us know that name, a respected Christian psychologist, explained that Trump had accepted Christ and was indeed a, a baby Christian. Now, he's backed away from that statement a little bit over the last week. But again, as you can imagine, uh, that also set off a firestorm of, of cynicism and, and sarcasm. Actually, some people uh, pointed back to uh, an incident that happened during the uh, Iowa primary campaign when uh, Mr. Trump was uh, campaigning in Iowa. He visited First Christian Church in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, on a Sunday morning, and apparently um, uh, in the course of the service, he was handed the communion tray and mistook it for the offering tray <laughs> and, and, uh, and actually dug out several bills uh, for the offering tray. Uh, and as far as we know, it's actually uh, the first instance of somebody receiving communion by dipping a 50 into the cup uh, and, and, and taking a bite. Now, now, let me just say, please hear this. Uh, first of all, I have no idea. No idea whatsoever about Mr. Trump's motives for the meeting in New York City, and even less do I know with certainty anything about his relationship with God. You'll be relieved to know uh, today this is not in any sense a sermon uh, about, uh, about politics. But for me, it's just intriguing that, that in the very same week, we were introduced to this figure, Zacchaeus, in Luke chapter 19, 1 to 10, last week, at least judging from the the flurry of, of Twitter posts and the grouchy comments on, on Facebook that, that we were, in fact, kind of witnessing this modern-day Zacchaeus story in real time. Um, you recall last week that I <clears throat> sort of introduced this passage by saying uh, it told the story of, of one of my Bible heroes. Remember I said that I had an Old Testament hero and a New Testament hero, and, 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 and I wonder, by the way, if, if any, um, I wonder what kind of conversations, I wonder if some of you on the way home last week or maybe around the table, or, or if you just gave some thought to who were, who are your Bible heroes? Now, it, it's kind of fun. I was actually talking with uh, some of you know Justin Teague. I was talking with him back there in a little green room. And I said, Justin, who is your, who is your uh, you know, favorite uh, Old Testament hero? And he thought about it and then he said, Frodo. And... and uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I kind of looked at him funny, you know, and then he smiled and said, I'm kidding, I know he's New Testament. But, uh, yeah, be, be praying for the folks in the band. But uh, if you have your Bible this morning, turn with me, please, again this week to Luke 
chapter 19, 1 to 10. Luke chapter 19, 1 to 10. And please, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like to have one so you can follow along, just uh, raise your hand. We will see that these good folks here will be happy to pass you one. Luke chapter 19. This is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. This is the gospel according to Luke chapter 19. And we're going to begin reading right in verse 1. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Uh, actually, let me just stop here very quickly to, to observe that we are coming with this passage to a, a major turning point in the gospel of Luke. Ever since uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus has been, has been traveling resolutely for Jerusalem. He knows it's a trip that will lead ultimately to his death, and, and yet it's it's a journey that is central to his mission. And so now, um, as this chapter opens, Jesus entering Jericho is literally about 23 miles from Jerusalem, from what will be the final week of his life. So, so these words have some real gravity. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Verse 2. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this, and they began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, and he had, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him today, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What we're going to see in this, uh, in this passage this week is that it, it offers sort of a case study, if you will, uh, of an authentic encounter with Jesus. It's a case study of an authentic encounter with Jesus. Maybe you wondered, uh, you know, what, what does it mean to actually have an authentic encounter with Jesus? Maybe, maybe you are, are visiting here at Faith Bridge. You've been coming over the last few months, or maybe you're joining us online, and, and, and uh, well, you, you ask yourself, you know, well, what does it actually mean to have a, an authentic encounter with Jesus? It's a, Luke, it's a story that uh, Luke tells us uh, using four key verbs. Four key, it's almost like stop motion photography. Luke tells us in four frames an amazing story about a wealthy man who became poor so that he could, in fact, become rich. The four verbs are, you see them there in the text. First of all, Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. That's verb number one. Verb number two, Zacchaeus made haste. Number three, Zacchaeus came down. Number four, Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. He received Jesus joyfully. As we said last week, I think what makes this such an intriguing story is that it's not just Zacchaeus' story. It could very well be your story, my story, our, our story. There, there's some actually interesting parallels between uh, Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus and the meeting that took place last week in New York City between Donald Trump and the evangelical leaders. Uh, first of all, uh, both of these encounters involve wealthy people. Right? We saw last week in Luke's account uh, of the incident that Zacchaeus, who of course is the primary uh, figure in the narrative, he was a man who was rich. Uh, I, and uh, I looked it up this week. Donald Trump, uh, according to one source, is worth $4.5 billion. One article described him as the Paris Hilton of the business world, which is surely high praise. Uh, in fact, the article said he was famous for being rich and rich for being famous. Secondly, both men, uh, at least I think in the eyes of some people, have achieved their wealth by means uh, that are possibly a little underhanded. Not necessarily illegal, but, but, but perhaps not honorable, right? Zacchaeus 
chief tax collector was clearly fleecing the people of Palestine by padding the tariffs and fees that they had to pay uh, to Rome. Uh, as many of us know, one of the common accusations that's made against Mr. Trump, although he disputes this, is that he's gotten rich by using borrowed money and stayed rich by declaring multiple bankruptcies. Uh, one Forbes article I read uh, recounted at least four bankruptcies just between 1991 and 2009. And I suppose uh, one additional similarity uh, might be the fact that both men actually have been identified by unique uh, physical uh, features. Zacchaeus, we talked about this last week, uh, was short on height. Donald Trump, of course, has very large hands. Uh, although I'm not going to elaborate any further on this uh, observation, but most noteworthy is, is that both of these men have, at least by some accounts, had an encounter with Jesus. And Zacchaeus is on the dusty streets of Jericho and Jesus spotted him up in a sycamore fig tree. Uh, Donald Trump uh, supposedly through some conversations with a, with a Florida televangelist. And then finally, finally, what both of these men have in common is that their encounters with Christianity triggered shockwaves to the religious and cultural system of his day. Luke describes in the text public outrage of the crowd that, that Jesus would invite himself to dinner at the home of a man who was so obviously a, a sinner. And of course, last week, the, the online crowd was outraged, uh, both that the evangelical leaders were even willing to meet with Mr. Trump, and, and then that one of their best known evangelical leaders uh, described Donald Trump as a new Christian. Of course, of course, we can never know a man's heart. So we don't really know how far the cemeteries really go between Zacchaeus and Donald Trump. But what both stories tell us and what the scripture points us to over and over again is this. Every authentic encounter with Jesus is a story that begins with the scandal of grace. Every authentic story of an encounter with Jesus always begins with the scandal of grace. Somebody who deserves to pay a penalty receives instead a gift. Somebody who ought to be caught and captured is instead someone who is sought and, and freed. The grace of God is always scandalous and undeserved. It's like, uh, I, I love to tell the story about the woman who had her portrait done and, and, and after it was painted, <clears throat> she was scandalized. I mean, she looked at it and she just, she just said to the artist, you know, this painting does not do me justice. And the artist looked at her and said, ma'am, with a face like yours, you don't want justice. You, you want mercy. Well, well I, I mention this because if you're here this morning and, and you're watching online or you're joining us there in the Woodlands campus and, and this church stuff kind of makes you feel a little bit awkward, a little bit weird, like, like maybe, you know, you don't belong here. Like you're, you're afraid you're going to, you know, stand at the wrong time or sing at the wrong time or, 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 or stick a $50 bill in a communion cup or, 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 or drink out of the offering tray. Uh, you know, I, I want you to know that you are precisely where you ought to be. You are precisely where you, don't let the crowd ever persuade you otherwise. Faith Bridge Church is a fellowship of the undeserving who have been overwhelmed and changed by the all forgiving. That's who we are. That, that's why we are here. My, my favorite explanation of the difference between grace and mercy is this. Grace is getting something good you do not deserve Mercy is not getting something bad you do deserve. That's the scandal of grace. That's the scandal and the wonder of grace. And, and it's that scandal of grace that sets the stage for Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 19. The first word, the first verb that Luke uses to tell his story is in verse 3 where we read, Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. Look at the text, verse 3. Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. Now, we said last week um, that there were three essential facts in Luke's uh, description of Zacchaeus. This week, the focus is on verbs. Last week, the focus was on adjectives. And we said Zacchaeus was short on height. 
And secondly, it was short on friends. Thirdly, there was one uh, area in which he did not fall short. He was not short on funds. Zacchaeus was rich. And yet, and yet, uh, despite the fact that he had pretty much everything money could buy, there must have been somewhere in Zacchaeus this nagging doubt that maybe there were some very important things that money couldn't buy. Couldn't buy. That, that, that's the only way we can account for what happened that day on, on the streets of Jericho when this grown man, a very public, well-recognized official, was so determined, according to verse 3 in Luke chapter 19, that he abandoned all dignity and, and, and pretense and ran ahead of the crowd so he could climb up into a sycamore fig tree so he could see who Jesus was. That's a guy who, who, who must have been hungry for something more than money. And in some ways, what we see in Zacchaeus is a study uh, in serious seeking. That, that Zacchaeus sort of gives us a portrait of serious seeking. Now, we all know the stereotypes that... Uh, that uh, of the serious seeker in our culture, right? You, you know, you you go to seminars uh, at hotels. You watch uh, PBS documentaries about God. You read books by Oprah or recommended by her. Uh, you you ditch your husband and eat, pray, and love your way around the globe. Or as one critic of the popular book uh, put it, uh, you masticate, supplicate, and fornicate. Or uh, maybe if you're a guy, uh, you don't do that. You don't go for that kind of stuff. Instead, uh, you and your buddies go to a sweat lodge and talk about your dads. Uh, or if all of that makes you feel uncomfortable or maybe just a little bit creepy, uh, then you just simply buy a book by some New age mystic, uh, light candles, burn incense, and go into a closet and smoke oatmeal. Uh, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus seemed to understand that his search was going to have to focus primarily on the person of Jesus. He, he wasn't listening to secondhand sources. He, he wasn't looking for some kind of spiritual back door. Verse 3, Luke says, Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was. If you are curious about or hungry for an authentic encounter with Jesus, start there. Start there. In fact, I suggest you, you begin simply by reading through this gospel, the gospel of Luke. Uh, it, it's fairly straightforward. He was a Greek doctor. He was a physician. So it's not so steeped in a lot of a kind of religious uh, language. In fact, he even says in the very first four verses of Luke chapter 1 that uh, he wrote his gospel so that a God seeker could know all that Jesus began to do and teach. But Zacchaeus begins this authentic encounter with Jesus by seeking to see who Jesus was. That's verb number one. Verb number one, Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. That's when Jesus uh, stopped under the tree, calls him by name, and, and, and says to him up there uh, on the branches of the sycamore fig tree, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. Come down immediately. And that's where Luke advances the narrative with the second verb. The second verb, verse 6. Look at verse 6. Luke tells us Zacchaeus acted immediately. He acted immediately. In some English Bibles, it actually uses the word Zacchaeus made haste. Uh, in, in other Bibles, it simply says hastily or immediately or, or all at once. But the Greek verb is there. And it points us, I think, to a very important statement about authentic life change. And that is a willingness not just to seek, but a willingness to find. A willingness to actually act on what is found. I think all of us, you know, we have those, we have those little pieces of life where we don't want to seek too hard for fear of, of what we might find because then, then we have to act, right, on what we actually uh, discovered, what we've actually found. For example, I, I, uh, I make it my policy to never lift one of the cushions on the sofa in our family room. I just don't do this. I don't, this is an invitation to difficulty. Because, you know, we have all these kids over to the house, and, of course, we have grandkids. 
and, uh, and, and you never know what you're going to find under these cushions. I, I, I uh, back right after Christmas, you know, uh, we, we, I made a mistake. We, we had just finished, you know, the Christmas party, having the students over. Of course, the grandkids had been there. And I made the mistake. I was actually looking for a pen. And uh, I made a mistake of, of lifting up one of these cushions. What I discovered was a, a, a nightmare of leftover cookies, uh, popcorn. Uh, I think there was some used Kleenex and, and a smashed donut. Now, now, the donut wasn't bad. But, 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 but all of a sudden, I found myself sort of faced with this question. Now, what are you going to do with this mess? What are you going to do with this mess? And so sometimes, frankly, it's a little bit easier not to seriously seek because we don't want to seriously act. And I think it, even in church, even sometimes for church goers, it's easy to kind of fall into that, that rut of sort of pretend seeking, right? We come week after week to sort of watch the Jesus parade, and, uh, and we hear the music, and we listen to the sermon, and sort of, you know, take in a little bit of Jesus, but we don't actually come with the intention to act. Zacchaeus didn't come just to see Jesus. He came to see who Jesus was. That's the difference between a, a stalker and a seeker. A religious photo op and, a, and an authentic life change. One sees the other finds. Zacchaeus had a heart that was earnest and open and, and ready to respond. He made haste. And then verb three. Verb number three, Zacchaeus came down. Zacchaeus came down. He left his hiding place up in the tree and came down to meet Jesus. That must have been extremely awkward. I mean, think about it. If you can imagine it in your mind's eye, you, you, you're, you know, you're up in the tree. You think perhaps you're, you're hidden a bit. You're sort of out of the line of sight. No one's going to notice you there. You're very self-conscious. You probably don't belong there, you think to yourself. And, and, and then all of a sudden, just as you think you're hidden, Jesus stops under your tree, looks up, and calls you by name, Zacchaeus. Come down immediately. All of a sudden, this crowd of people is looking up at you angrily, and, 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 and they watch as you awkwardly, uh, embarrassingly, uh, not gracefully make your way down to the ground. It must have been humiliating. I think, one of the, I think one of the main reasons that a lot of us do not experience the joy of an authentic encounter with Jesus is because, frankly, uh, that usually involves some element of coming down. You know, part of what it means to, to seek Jesus is to humble ourselves, to humble ourselves, to come out of our hiding places so we can be found, to expose ourselves to his healing touch. And man, do we ever resist that. It, it, it is amazing what we will tolerate. It's amazing what we will put up with. We have, by birth, I think, this radical resistance to coming down. Our pride always kind of tells us, stay up in the tree where it's safe, you know, where, where, where you won't be exposed, where you can keep your distance. No small groups, nothing like that, no Bible studies. We want to maintain the, the high ground. We make every effort to avoid any situation where people might look down on us. Maybe even some of us here this morning. We are, we, are, we are unable to really find the joy of this true encounter with Christ because, frankly, we are afraid of the humiliation, of the come down it might mean in front of our friends, in front of folks at work, in front of the, the guys in, in, the, in the gym, the, the folks in the book club, uh, m maybe, even, maybe even our friends here at church. And so we miss out. We miss out on this feast, on this authentic encounter with Jesus. We will never see Jesus from above him. We will never see Jesus from above him because our pride blocks the view. To experience Christ, to, to know him, we must come down. We have to bow before him. Uh, Peter puts it this way, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may lift you up. Zacchaeus was willing to come 
down. And then that fourth verb. That fourth verb, Zacchaeus made haste, came down, and received Jesus joyfully. Made haste, came down, and received Jesus joyfully. I think we can all imagine there probably were a lot of reasons why Zacchaeus might have stayed up in the tree, right? I mean, we've already talked about pride. I think that's a big one, but frankly, I think, I think one of the reasons that, primary reason that Zacchaeus uh, might have missed out on this authentic encounter with Jesus is, is, just, is just raw fear, right? I mean, we don't, we don't know exactly how it happened that day. Uh, apparently, the way uh, the narrative unfolds, we, we, it appears that Zacchaeus had maybe caught a glimpse of Jesus, or at least of the crowd, but recognized there's no way he's going to be able to see him well uh, on ground level. And so he runs on ahead, climbs up into the tree. We don't know how long he's there. Uh, maybe it's only a matter of moments, but sure enough, that's when he sees it, this throng of people surging around the corner, coming down the main drag there in, in Jericho, and uh, dogs and goats and sheep are kind of running in all directions, with little kids kind of screaming out in front of the crowd, and shopkeepers coming out of the shops, and, and, and Zacchaeus begins to, to strain his eyes, and that's when he sees him right there in the middle of the throng, and, and he's thinking, this is unbelievable, this is fantastic. I'm going to be able to see this guy that I've heard so much about. This guy has raised people from the dead. That This guy has been willing to kind of challenge the Pharisees, the religious establishment, and, and has brought sight to the blind. I'm going to be able to see him. He's going to come right under my tree. I'll be able to look directly into his face, eyeball to eyeball. And I think that's when it hits him. You idiot. You idiot. If you can see him... He can see you. He can see you. These are the, these are the eyes that, that stared into the hearts of the Pharisees. This is the holy God of Israel in the flesh. If, if he stops under your tree, Zacchaeus, I mean, Zacchaeus knows. He, he understands. This is not going to be pretty. I mean, I, I would have not blamed him in the least if his very first instinct would have simply been to hide, you know, just Zacchaeus and, and just hide, just, you know, you know, there is no Zacchaeus up. I mean, I, I don't know. In one sense, I think we can totally imagine why Zacchaeus might have wanted to stay up there and not have an encounter with Jesus. Zacchaeus probably figured, look, if he knows my name, he knows my deeds, and if he knows my deeds, my name is mud. This is not going to be pretty. This is not going to turn out well. You know, in, in my years of youth ministry, um, I've actually come to believe that this is actually one of the main reasons that young people in particular hide from God. I think it's true for all of us generally. But, but specifically for young people, because they fear, they fear this kind of honest encounter with God. Because first of all, when you're a teenager, uh, there's always this general sense that you've probably done something wrong. And you probably have. Uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, you know, even my own daughters, I'd say, hey, Aaron and Katie, come downstairs a minute. You know what they say? Do we do something wrong? Are we in trouble? Like, we don't allow them on the ground floor except for torture. You know, come on down. Your mom's got the machete. It's a Bill character. Hurts her more than it hurts you. I mean, when you're a teenager, you almost always kind of feel like you probably have done something wrong. And then secondly, we talked about this before, that, that when you're a teenager, anytime an adult wants to talk with you, that's usually a bad sign. That's it. You know, when you're sitting in homeroom and someone comes over the loudspeaker and says, please send Duffy Robbins to the office, that's not likely because the principal is lonely. You know, you, you, have, you, have, you have violated some sanction. You have done something wrong. When you hear your name called in public, your best play usually is to duck. And I think that most of us, if we have any self-awareness whatsoever about our own shortcomings, we have this sense that if Jesus stopped under our tree, it would not be pretty. Like, you know, is that Duffy Robbins up there? You know, hand me my chainsaw. I mean, there, there's just this sense, right, that it's going to be ugly. 
But the miracle of the incarnation, this is so important. The miracle of the incarnation is that Jesus is not just fully God. He is that, holy and righteous. Our sin is an offense to his majesty. But he's not just fully God. He's also fully human. He's fully human. So, so to that extent, he understands our temptations. He understands our longings and, and our weaknesses. That's why that day, that's why he, he could look up uh, into that tree and look deep into Zacchaeus' heart and see all of his faults and all of his shortcomings and yet still see him with love. The writer of Hebrews uh, puts it like this, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then these words, let us then with confidence draw near. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Jesus said it, Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, the lost. Well, we don't know. We don't know exactly what Zacchaeus was thinking that day, but here's, here's what we do know. The Scripture says Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly, welcomed him gladly. Gladly. Literally, the, the translation is he received Jesus joyfully. Think about those last three words. That's, that's very profound. Received Jesus joyfully. But what, what a contrast from Jesus' last encounter with a wealthy politician, the rich young ruler. It happened only one chapter earlier in Luke chapter 19. Remember that encounter? Remember that conversation? The rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, well, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, uh, how about obeying the commandments? How, how would that work for you? And, and the guy goes, oh my gosh, like I've t- totally done all that. Uh, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Uh, what else do I still lack? And Jesus says, well, <clears throat> how about this? How about selling everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me, follow me. And the Bible says, He went away sad. The rich young man went away sad because he had great possessions. So one guy encounters Jesus and walks away sad, and one guy encounters Jesus and walks away joyfully. And the difference, the difference, if you compare the two stories side by side, it comes down to money. It comes down to money. Look at verse 8. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. So you know, it wasn't so much the money itself that was the big deal. But for these two guys, it was money that marked the difference of authentic commitment. One rich guy was willing to surrender to Jesus no matter the cost. The other rich guy walked away sadly because of the cost. Now, now let's make sure we see this. Luke, you know, wants to be very clear. Zacchaeus didn't give up his possessions as a condition of grace. Zacchaeus gave up his possessions as a response to grace. Zacchaeus was so just overwhelmed by Jesus' scandalous act of, of love and mercy that he responds with a scandalous act of, 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 of gratitude and restitution. He says, look, I, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. This was, this was way above and beyond anything the law required of him in terms of a fraudulent business deal. But he went the extra mile. It was an overflow. That, that, that's, the, that's the nature of authentic life change. He didn't do this to earn Jesus' love. Zacchaeus did this in response to Jesus' love. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because he first, he first loved us. Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. He made haste. He came down. And he received Jesus joyfully. I think the pivotal point 
And this whole drama is when Zacchaeus comes down from that old uh, sycamore fig tree. That moment in the drama is so key. Every, every Zacchaeus flannel graph, every VBS Sunday school drama, every puppet show, they all focus on the tree. That's the turning point in the story. And what makes that so ironic is that only a few chapters later, possibly as little as 10 to 14 days in the actual chronology of the story, there's a much bigger turning point in an even bigger story. And it also involves a tree. This one has been fashioned into the shape of a cross. And on that occasion, it's Jesus who is up in the tree. Jesus is on the cross, and it's there that he pays the price of his blood so that tax collectors and cheats and and people like Zacchaeus and, and you and me might have life. The sinless dying in the place of the sinful. That's the scandal of grace. If you're here today and you've never had an encounter, an authentic encounter with Jesus, why not let this be the day that salvation comes to your house? You know, don't, don't let pride and, and, and fear keep you up there hiding in the tree. Don't let your shortcomings keep you from the wonder of scandalous grace. Jesus wants to bring his feast to your house. Revelation 3 verse 20 puts it this way. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, anyone, I will come in and eat with that person and he with me. Don't walk away, sadly, this July 3rd Sunday morning. Receive him joyfully. You know, as I said from the get-go, none of us knows if this is truly Donald Trump's story. But what we do know is that it is Zacchaeus' story. And it could, it could even today be your story. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Make haste, come down, receive him joyfully. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning for those of us who might be perched on a limb. We are truly out on a limb in our marriages, in our lives, in our hearts, in our concerns, in our guilt, in our business dealings. And yet, Lord, uh, we wonder, could it really be that Jesus would invite me down? Would he call me by name? Would he come to my house? Lord, I pray today that you would help us to recognize that whether we are rich and or famous, whether everyone knows our name or no one knows us at all, that we'd recognize the scandal of grace is that all are welcome if any person opens the door. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would help us to have the courage to come down out of the tree. It may be awkward. It may feel weird. It may be ungraceful in some ways. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to receive you joyfully. If you are here today and you think maybe this is a prayer you'd like to pray for yourself or you'd like to ask questions about this, I want to encourage you this morning, before you leave, we have some folks up here in the front. They'd be happy to meet with you, members of our prayer team. If you're joining us online, you can get in touch with us here at Faith Bridge. We'd love to talk with you more about being a part of this great feast with Jesus. We pray all this, Lord, with thanksgiving. In Jesus' strong name, and everybody said, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Duffy Robbins, who just brought part two of the Zacchaeus story and a great play on words there for the title, Grace, 
Trumps. Yes, and so <laughs> let's just talk about that a little bit because you did open with this comparison of our current political scene and Zacchaeus. Um, and I can't help but think the meeting with the evangelicals um, that are, we could be a bit cynical about that I, I, and those kind of things. Sure. Maybe being skeptic sure. about some people's um, ability to come to the Lord or things like that. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's funny because if, if, uh, if, a, if a political candidate sort of just blows off the church or Christianity, we get upset about that. If they say, I want to meet with some Christian leaders, we get upset about that. Uh, it, I think um, our role uh, as Christians is to be listeners, is to be there, is to engage in conversation, engage in the culture where we're invited and, and, and where we have opportunity. Uh, because uh, sometimes we're not invited, but we have opportunities. We need to be engaged. So, uh, yeah, I think there is a cynicism, and that's where you have to be very careful because, we, like you said, we go, well, you know, that person. Like, I've been praying for James Taylor for, like, I don't know, 20 years <laughs> to, to come to know the Lord. And, uh, and you know, you, oh, well, that person will never do. This person will never. Uh, you know what? Uh, with God, all things are possible. I mean, Truth be told, we're not as famous, but anybody who knew us would have said, oh, Duffy, he will never, he, will, he is not a candidate for a relationship with Jesus. And so uh, I have to remember that, that uh, you know, all of us, in a sense, are ex big, huge surprises of mm -hmm. grace. All of us are, are completely, uh, you know, unlikely candidates to, to be invited into the kingdom of God. And so I think if a, if a guy like Donald Trump, I, I don't know his heart, I don't know what he's thinking, and, uh, but, if, but if he says, you know, would you be willing to meet, I think that, that's uh, an invitation we want to take seriously. I, I have a, a friend who, uh, when President Clinton was going through all of his uh, difficulties and the adultery with Monica Lewinsky and that whole deal, uh, he sought my friend for pastoral counsel, and, and my friend gave it. Mm -hmm. And people said, well, don't you think he's using you? Don't you think that's kind of like he's just trying to get political mileage out of the relationship with you? And, um, and my friend said, yeah, but, but, but what, about, uh, you know, what about Daniel being a, a counselor mm -hmm. to the king? And, and, uh, okay. and, and maybe in a sense, uh, we want to be, we want to be savvy. We want to try to be wise in the way we do this, but, uh, to somehow turn away because someone doesn't know the Lord is like a doctor saying, Oh, I don't work on sick people. Uh, those are precisely the people who need the care of a physician. They need healing. And so, so, uh, I, I think this is part of our mandate a as a church. Good. And that, I like, we were talking about how you've been praying for, for James Taylor for years. Yeah. Just a good reminder for us, for both of our candidates to continue Absolutely. to pray for, yeah, yeah. to pray for them. Okay. You said something, um, in that, that I wanted to just kind of touch on. Um, you said we can't know their heart. And I think sometimes when, when we're evangelizing or we're sharing the gospel, we feel so much responsibility that we have to say the right thing mm -hmm. or we have to do the right, right. thing for them. Yeah. Um, why is it so important that we trust God in this to do the work? Well, because, yeah, because like you said, we don't, we do not know uh, someone's heart. Now, uh, you know, in the Zacchaeus narrative, you know, there's uh, a very telling verse there in verse eight where we actually are able to see mm -hmm. or get a glimpse of Zacchaeus's heart because he he actually says, everything I've stolen, I'm going to return it and, and I'm going to return it fourfold. And if he's defrauded anybody out of anything, he's going to give it back. So, uh, and, and the way he says it, as I mentioned this in the sermon, is that he actually is going way beyond what he had to do. So this is a guy clearly who, who wanted uh, to make things right. He was overwhelmed by grace and wanted to respond uh, with restitution in a generous and gracious way. Uh, <clears throat> we don't always see that fruit. I think um, Jesus tells us that, you know, that, that fruit is important, that the fruit of repentance is important. We see that in Scripture. And, uh, and it's not wrong, or, uh, nor is it, I think, um, 
unwise to kind of say, well, what about that? You know, you, you said you became a Christian, uh, you know, or someone has said they became a Christian. If I have a friend who says, I'm following the Lord, you know, that, that, or I've accepted Christ, to see the fruits of mm-hmm. repentance. But uh, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, none of us sees as deeply into the heart mm-hmm. as does the Lord. Uh, we can, as Jesus put it, know a tree by its fruit, but fruit also takes seasons before it becomes mature. And we are often quick to say, oh, okay, well, fine. I don't see the fruit yet. And, and we just sort of cross them off of our grace list. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm glad God doesn't deal with us that way. Yeah, that's so good. What a, a great message today. And um just so encouraging for us to give grace um, to people and then also talking about salvation, coming to his house um, and how um, no one is too far from the grace of God. So thank you for that message, Duffy. And thank Thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.